So, yeah, getting right into this thing. What exactly is healing divinity all about? It is self-realization to know thyself, to realize that we're all divine and that everything in life is happening for us, that everything is divine, even through the most challenges, challenging circumstances and suffering that we might go through as humans. Um, it's happening for us. And so when I had my awakening back in 2011, that was, I was going through a really, really uh, challenging uh, circumstances. And I was praying really hard to God. And I discovered that I had this awakening and I realized everything is love, everything is God. And I was called within to heal, but it was heal myself, but also heal others. I kept hearing heal, heal. And I started working as a healer and didn't take any courses or anything. I was prompted to sort of just listen within to what I needed to do and what I should do. And just to my mind of going into people's energy body and, and see what needed to be done and listening deeply. And I mean, as much as I see myself as a teacher, I'm still very much learning. I'm still very much discovering. And, and my path is very much about understanding myself. I haven't reached to a point where I don't have any human desires, right? There's, I know there's a state where you've reached a highest samadhi where you like you, all you want is God. And so I haven't reached that. So there's still this where I work with helping people, but it's also for me, my path of discovering um, where do I still have limitations? Where do I still have blockages from realizing my own divinity and understanding that? And then what is it that in my perception and in my views that is blocking me from seeing divinity in, within everyone? Um, Maya is powerful, like this illusion, this dream that we're in is very, very powerful. Um, so, yeah, healing divinity as much as for myself as and for a service to others and helping others. Mm, wonderful. Beautiful. Serve yourself and serve your self with an uppercase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the name of the game. I don't see any other way, you know? Once you start to quote unquote awaken and you see things in a different light, you see in the light that you have to, in one way or the other, as you help yourself, help the others. It's the same thing, as above, so below. I think that just comes with the realization, you know? It just comes with the territory. Yeah. So, where does this come from for you? Like, how did you see that your self extends maybe a little bit further than just your body, just your five senses? How did you come to feel this and work with this recognition? I wanted to know if there was a God. I was going mm. through, like I said, I was going through a very, very dark um part of my life and I wanted to die and I didn't know what would happen if I died and I come from an atheist family and so the 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 longing to die was so strong but I didn't know right so I found this book by um, Yogananda an autobiography of a yogi and that was the first time um, that I read about someone that had a relationship to God and knowing of God, an actual knowing of God mm. that really resonated. So after I read that, I started praying. I prayed that I wanted to know God like he knew God. 
God. Like to have a personal relationship with God. And as I started praying, things started to shift dramatically in my life. I didn't notice it at the time, but looking back, I like I started changing my diet, I started meditating every day, I started doing yoga. And it wasn't it wasn't consciously that I chose that. It sort of just happened. And then one day during meditation, I had this realization that um, a big opening in meditation where I opened my third eye and I just I realized everything is love. And then from that moment, everything shifted. I started experiencing everything as energy feeling people's emotions and pains and sufferings really deeply. It was very overwhelming at first and Uh very confusing. Um, And then that's 13 and a half years ago now. And so now I have much more tools. I work with a lot of people through my healing and things like that, but I find that I still lose myself at times (laughs) to know right like yep. that this is god interacting with me um so it's it's having compassion for oneself and it's like a continuous learning of growing and learning and peeling the layers and sometimes the ego really really wants to hold on to this ego and identity and form and the idea of merging with it all is not at all appealing so oh, no. that's the that's that's the last thing that the ego wants is the disintegration <laughs> of the ego essentially because that's the goal if you want to call it a goal in this path is the disintegration the extinguishing of the ego and all of its desires and a true surrender to god the divine you can't yeah. have one and it's no like half measures it's one or the other yeah you know? But we try. That's like you said, we try. The ego will try. It will always try to be mischievous in a way and uh, make you believe that it is the master when it's really not. And uh, I guess that's the path and that's the work and why we do all of this stuff is to um, is to sort of get rid of those samskaras, right? The karma that we've built up. I don't think this happens overnight, even though we may get a glimpse through meditation you know i feel as though once you do get a realization it's just the starting point it's kind of like um it's a very huge starting point for sure but there's still things you have to work through is what i'm trying to say you know it's like just because you realize that there is a god that's not the end of the journey but that's actually (laughs) that's the good news right that's the beginning more of it (laughs) yeah then that's um yeah the journey is the destination that's the cliche right but that is the that is the truth i fully believe and uh yeah a lot of people that i speak to have that same essence that brings them to god it's like there's got to be some other way just so much suffering that is happening in one's life and mm-hmm. there's got to be another way and it's interesting how you prayed and you didn't even believe but it was like in that moment ultimate surrender right the suffering is what brought you to the ultimate surrender and asking asking to know yeah 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 right it's like oh man does it have to be that way but i think it does i think it has to be that way right i think you have to suffer and that's what we're all doing here. It's like we're all suffering in one way or the other so we can come back to God and realize that love really is the truth. Same thing, God and love. It's the same thing. I think we have to choose, right? It's the, the, the coming to the point where it's like you either yeah. choose love or you choose fear. Yep. You either choose love, unity, or you choose separation. Mm. And when we choose separation, when you choose fear, especially I find when you're further along the path um it can bring you on your knees because it's it's the it becomes an even more impact right it's Mm. like really you're doing this again okay (laughs) (laughs) yep seriously yeah um i mean 
do you feel as though that is the path for all of us? In one way or the other, in all of our circumstances, in all of our karma? Yes. It might not happen in this lifetime, but I think that we're all here to know ourselves, like our true selves. And whether it takes a thousand lifetimes for a person to realize that, then Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's not judging where someone is on the path, but I think we're all here to realize that we are divine. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And that's a solid point you brought up about how this makes a lot more sense in the context of reincarnation, because if we were to just analyze what I just said in terms of this lifetime, that's ludicrous. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think uh, within the next hundred years, right, that people are going to realize that love is the truth and that God is real, unfortunately. But in the scheme of things, I think it's happening actually very fast. We may look at just this one lifetime and look at it as a slow process, but from the amount of people that I've spoken to and the amount of people that tune in to our stuff and just the whole, this sort of underground collective awakening that I witness going on. I don't think it's, would you say it's immense? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's immense. It's very immense. You won't see all any of that on the news, but if you tune in, you'll be able to see this sort of secret um revolution in a way the revolution will not be televised and i think it's happening quite quickly in the scheme of time not maybe in the scheme of our lifetime but in the scheme of time altogether it's happening exponentially i would say let's see um just from from when i first had my awakening and i was i mean looking so much on internet for information until now 13 years later oh yeah there's so much more information. There's so mm-hmm. many people talking about having a Kundalini awakening, having a spiritual awakening, plant medicines. I mean, it's exploded. Um, yeah. So, and in, in, in my healing work, one, I have more energy. I've done more work. So, of course, it's easier for me. But I also see the assistance. Um, like things are moving through. Things are shifting quicker. Mm-hmm. It's like the assistance, the light that we're being bombarded with yeah. from the sun that's coming from Earth. Like it's all accelerating. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm very hopeful and positive about what might happen in the next couple of years mm-hmm. and a few years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe in this lifetime it will happen. <laughs> Who knows? I don't I don't believe so but within the next I'd say two or three we're gonna see really big change you know my grandchildren (laughs) my grandchildren are gonna live in a completely different world it will look completely alien to the one that we are in right now in many different aspects I feel I always say to myself I'm gonna stop doing this podcast when I can't find anybody else to talk to. That's been my motto for the last maybe few months. I've said everything I need to say. (laughs) I feel like I've asked everything I need to ask to people, but I always find new people on the internet and there's something in me that says I have to, I have to talk to them. There's something, there would be resistance if I didn't reach out, right? And I'm continually finding new people, new guides, new teachers to reach out and have a conversation with. And to me, that's just proof of the times that we're in, the extraordinary times of the amount of very wise souls that are here to guide other people along the way. It's truly remarkable. The ones Mm -hmm. that are alive today and sages of the past, like you mentioned, like Yogananda, that have thankfully left the imprint on the Dharma for all of us. It's truly remarkable, right? Like, this is the lifetime. I like to say that this is the lifetime for all of us to be able to to see this and actually realize God, that God is truly real. Um, yeah, so... And internet, too. What's that? The internet? Internet, so that we can find each other through internet. Yeah, and establishing community. People. Yeah, mm-hmm. even like YouTube, that people can share their spiritual experiences. Before yes. internet, there was not that. Mm-hmm. 
Like you can, you can hear you had a spiritual experience, and then if there was no one in your village or town that had that, <laughs> yeah, then how would you know that what that was even about? You how wouldn't. could you find a teacher exactly? Yeah. So we have so much at our disposal, right? And I feel like it could be gleaned over because it can get lost in all the other content of the internet, right? It can just be like another form of entertainment. But if one really dives into this stuff, this dharma, you'll see that it's a lot different. I like to say this is almost, in a way, like the new internet. All of the people that I'm speaking to, amongst many others, are creating this new form of internet. And it's not using any different technology. It's not real. It's not using a different language. It's not that much different. But it's just about the communities that are forming. Within this internet, and what is the internet really all together? It's just communities, right? It's just different decentralized communities, you could say. So I think this one that we're creating is just like a sangha. It's a new, almost alternative internet, an alternative lifestyle and wavelength that is being established, and almost like a mycelial network. You know what I mean?、Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's quite special that we have that for sure. Because if not, like you said. Fifty to a hundred years ago, if we didn't know any of the wise men or women, and they weren't locally in our area, you'd be caught in the darkness, unfortunately. So, hallelujah to the times that we are in. But, but there's one important aspect to that is、yep. to remember to not always look for answers on internet,、yes. but also look for answers within and、yeah. to listen. Amen. Without and taking breaks from that because that's、yeah. a really really important things.、Um, we all have the answers within, and I just had a ceremony last week, and some of the messages with Wachuma San Pedro,、mm -hmm. and one of the messages came through is that I have a druid past,、uh, past lifetimes, and also my lineage. Wow. And it was saying, "Don't look online," because I've known that, but I got it kind of spelled out to me.、Mm. And I've been looking on internet for information about druids, and it was like, "Don't look online. Listen."、Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's such an important part. We can get lost in reading books or looking for information from others, when actually the guidance and the the knowing,、mm. the inkling that oh, I want to know more about this. We can find that through listening. We can find that through sitting with it, the the question. Yeah. And so there's the balance of that, but ultimately the answers are within. Amen. Yes, that's an important caveat because、yeah. it could just be another trap. The spiritual community, all these teachers, the guidance could just be another false idol. I like to say, if the teacher or guru isn't leading you within, then they're not a true teacher. They're just wasting your time. Any true teaching, any pure teaching, is just leading you back to you. If it's not, like I said, it's just like any other entertainment,、it's、just like cat videos, <laughs> yeah, or dance videos. It's just a distraction. So yeah, there's a there's a、um, fine line that one has to toe when trying to find guidance online. It can be very helpful, but also very destructive.、Mm -hmm. If you don't actually do, like, take action in your own life. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's all about you. Be still and know. <laughs> yeah.、Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel as though there is like inherent wisdom that comes from simply disconnecting from the drama, Maya, and going within? Do you feel as though that there is this teacher, you could say, that is within you that Is providing wisdom at all times. Yeah, I can also see that at times I、um, lose that connection, and I so like daily meditation is very important for me. Mm. Mm -hmm.、um, and the further I go on the path, I realize the more important it is. Mm. Mm hmm.、Uh, So it needs to. I need to create space in my own life to connect with that teacher within, and I also need to connect with teachers that are further along my path.、Um, yeah. And whether it's reading their words or listening to them,、um, 
or calling upon them if they're not in this lifetime anymore, but calling upon them for support and guidance um, to be able to reconnect with that teacher. Because what I know that going through this awakening process is that it's openings and there's contractions. Mm -hmm. And when we go through the contractions, it can be very hard to reach the teacher because the feelings can be so overwhelming at that contraction of being in pain and being in suffering and feeling closed off or like not understanding why. Um, so especially in those times, it's like praying, praying for help, praying for support, mm. uh, listening to people that are further on the path. Um, Krishnamurti, Yogananda, people that have had realizations and that are further along the path and sort of holds this alignment better than me so then I can listen to that and then go back and meditate and that that shifts that helps me to shift so that I can access the teacher within um yeah Yeah. Mm. do you feel as though once you see it you can't unsee it even though we may get lost in the darkness a little bit yeah, uh, there's always that little glimmer of light within, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that can be very frustrating uh, when you're going through a contraction, right? Like, why, why? If I've had this realization, if I've done all this work, why am I going through yet another contraction? Why? Hmm. Um, but then it moves through faster, and there's the 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 deeper layer of the onion, right? Of understanding, yeah. of of knowing. And so then you come through that and it's this kind of light, this kind of embodiedness becomes stronger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think you said it in the beginning. That that light coincides with even if it's really, really dark, depending on our situation, it's hard to say, it's hard to generalize, but I think always once you see that light coincides with the wavelength of how is this happening for me, even though it might suck, right? We might go through a lot of shit, but I think once you see it, that all of this is for you, it's hard to unsee that, right? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. It still, it doesn't make it not suck, but you know that <laughs> amidst the sucking, <laughs> that it's happening for you in one way or the other. And that's truly a blessing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because even though the, there's a challenging, you know that somehow there is going to be something else on the other side. Yeah. Because you've experienced that, right? Mm. Like if you experience it once, twice, 10 times, 100 times, and eventually you know, like, once I go through this, there's going to be something else. This is inviting me to shift somehow. I don't know why or how, but it's going to shift me into something better. Yeah. Uh, so it gets easier. It does. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you this one. So not only does the universe shift, you could say, to be for our betterment, for our growth, so that ultimately we don't go through that stuff anymore, <laughs> right? We suffer so we don't have to suffer anymore in a certain way. But also, where do you think this takes us in terms of how we are as an expression in humanly form? As in, is there an archetype to the sage or the shaman on how we embody that? Does it make us more of a servant, compassionate, loving toward others, more understanding? Like, is there a way to describe where this is all taking us? Like, if we're growing, you could say, or maybe evolving or shedding the layers of the onion, where are we growing into? Like, what is the end goal to all of this? in a collective level like what does it look like to be the sage i guess it's another way to ask 
Well, when you, I mean, archetype, I think that it's very easy to get lost in the path. And I've seen a lot of people get lost in the path into very, like, having a lot of powers and going into full on ego. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's an archetype, but I think where we all want to aim is towards being, becoming more loving and more mm -hmm. graceful and being of service yeah. and wanting to share and opening to that. But I also think that each one of us, because there's so many people awakening and on the path, that each person's path is unique mm. and each personality is unique as it should be, like a divine unique expression um and that's perfect yeah because to awaken all of the collective consciousness we need all different unique teachers yeah uh from all different lineages from many different paths yeah of different personalities with their own unique frequency to be able to call as many people as possible so archetype I think we're, like I said, we're, we're, I mean, the path is leading to unity, consciousness, and love, but the paths there are many, mm -hmm. and the pitfalls are many. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. It really is that simple. It's leading to love. <laughs> yeah. Yet, in our own way, we become our own Buddha, right? There is many, many examples of the past. But yet, they're their own thing. They're their own embodiment. They're their own expression of the divine. And I think all of our own path is that we embody this sainthood, if you want to call it that, in our own way, through our own circumstances and trials and tribulations. And um, yeah, not in a grandiose way. You could be the Buddha as a janitor. You could be the Buddha as a trash guy. You could be the Buddha in really anything. But there's a certain wavelength of losing oneself in whatever way that the Dharma yields for their life that is it's there's it's kind of a contradiction or a paradox. It's similar throughout all beings in the differences. It's the same wavelength, but yet in how it comes about to express this wavelength is uniquely beautiful. Right? It's a dance. Mm -hmm. It's a dance between that between the yeah. similarity and the difference. So there is, I guess, maybe an archetype, but it's not like something to, um, something to copy. <laughs> it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain, but that's the beauty of it, right? Is that we're all, all of us are really unique beings. All of us truly are not like, we are alike in some, at our deeper primordial way, but on the surface level, we are very unique in our expression here. Yeah, and a part of the awakening, a big part of the awakening is peeling away the social conditioning yeah. of wanting to fit in or mm -hmm. wanting to, right? Like where we peel off our awakening or added layers to kind of added masks mm. to not be who we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the awakening is about peeling away that and allowing your true authentic self to come through and loving thyself. Mm hmm yeah. yeah. <sighs> and so I think more than maybe even aiming for sainthood is like really filling yourself with love because you have to fill your cup before you can give. And so the idea of martyrdom or like, I mean, all of those concepts has to be cleared. Um, and that's not in like an egoic sense. It's like when you're truly filled with love, what you want to do is you want to share love. Yeah. Um, right. Like yeah. you just want to love everyone and everything. Um, so, so there is no like right answers. That's a been big part for me is like there's no true answers really it's about more like deconstructing the ideas of what i thought i should be mm -hmm. yeah even the spiritual ideas that's the tricky part yeah yeah, yeah. 
that's the last thing to let go of or maybe not the last thing there is no there is no linear sequence but that's uh i feel as though an attachment that we we build up on the path is um the spiritual path that is an attachment in itself it can be i feel like it's a virtuous attachment but eventually it comes along the way to let go of all the ideas of being holy <laughs> Because then you just become fake holy, and that's not <laughs> conducive yeah. to anyone's uh, betterment. <laughs> you only and suffer you more. And you lose your authenticity. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I feel that. Yeah. Let me ask you this one because you brought it up. <laughs> uh, you said you did San Pedro uh -huh. ceremony. Okay. So, what do you feel is the value or power? in these psychedelic sacraments such as San Pedro or whatever else you have done in the past that you'd like to get into. Why do we do these things and why are they so um, important for your life and realization? They help me to clear things. Like mm -hmm. they have been some of my greatest guides. Um, and the shamanic path was very clear for me from like very soon after my awakening, I had a profound experience with peyote in the desert of Iracuta in northern Mexico. And it was peyote that told me, you're a healer. Mm. Uh, and so that was about a year after my awakening. And that whole year, I'd been looking for teachers, right? Like, And that was like, ah, this is a teacher. I can ingest a plant, yes. and the plant will tell me what I should do or tell me what is what's blocking me and actually help me clear this pain within me and help to clear this obstruction within me from seeing the truth and to help me transform. Mm -hmm. And so I work with a lot of different plants. It's been some of my greatest teachers. Yeah. Yeah. You too? I've never done peyote, N never done peyote, but I've done a lot of um, mushrooms, <laughs> to say the least. Oh, I've done nice. a lot of mushrooms in my day. And what you said, touching upon your point, is that they clear energy. It's a great purging process. I feel as though we build up stagnant energy or we have these blockages that we aren't even aware of, and they're very hard to see. They're very just thick and almost behind the scenes of our mind. It's like we don't want to recognize these blockages from the it's ego, just essentially. It's the subconscious. Yeah, yeah, it's trauma. It's trauma that we have built up over the years. So it's very hard to see, unless you're like an ardent meditator, but most of us aren't, let's be honest, where we got put food on the table, we got stuff to do. So that stuff just stays in there. It's stuck in there. It's hard to see. But if you do psychedelics in a responsible manner, with a shaman maybe, if you do them... When the right set and setting, they will allow these blockages to just, in the session, just, and you feel renewed. There is just this new way of seeing things. It's just very efficient and effective way to be able to just see through your BS <laughs> that you don't even know is there. So, yeah, that's, um, that's how I feel is the power of psychedelics, at least one aspect of them. And also for me, and maybe you can attest, is that... They allow me to see that there's way more going on than meets the eye. There's way more than just the materialism of our current society, the illusion of Maya. We get to see how really, really thick it is. So when you're in the session of, I'll speak on psilocybin, when you're on a high-dose psilocybin trip and um, you're in it, it's quite apparent what the truth is. All the stuff we've been talking about for the last hour during a psychedelic experience makes a lot more sense from a different it just completely changes up your perspective like it's from a different vantage point in a certain way it's quite foreign to the mind it completely shifts you and it's not like well i was gonna say it, it shifts you into like a different you're still here but it's like you're 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 seeing what here is just completely foreign but it's not foreign as in like strange it's just foreign to the mind you're just in 
I don't know, I don't want to go too much into it, but you're just seeing life a lot differently from a conscious perspective, as you could say. A, a psychedelic experience will allow one to do that. So well, you can have the direct yeah. experience, right? Direct experience, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's there for you. Exactly. Uh -huh. And you can have that without psychedelics for sure. 100%. Yeah, of course. Of course. I think that's what the path is all about is like taking that wavelength and incorporating it into our regular life to the best of our ability. But when you're using the medicine, it will just allow you to know that it's real because that direct experience is priceless. And when you're in it, it's realer than real. It's like this. Yes, of course. Of course, because the mind likes to doubt. There may even be people listening to us that doubt what we say. I know that happens. I doubt what I say sometimes, too. I doubt, I doubt a lot. But when you take a little bit of plant medicine, there is the doubt just goes out the window. It's like, oh, oh yeah, of course, love is the truth. It's God is real and <laughs> yada, yada, right? It's like so apparent, right? It makes this stuff so apparent. And that can also be another attachment right you can that can be another false idol as we spoke before i've seen that too people using it as a sort of escape so i think it's like we take what we need from the medicine and we ideally incorporate that into our life to the best of our ability i agree? think it's really important yeah i think it's really important to still have meditation practice yeah oh right like mm -hmm. if you just if you don't because there's the integration too, which I'm sure you know. Like mm -hmm. you take the plant medicines, you have a big ceremony, big expansion, and then a couple of days later, you might experience a huge contraction mm -hmm. because that expansion still needs to be embodied. It still needs yeah. to be integrated. Yeah. And so, oh, there's all this stuff within you that needs to shift, and that's not always comfortable. Mm. And so understanding that when you work with plant medicine so that you don't like oh i feel funky i'm gonna go and do more yeah it, yeah that doesn't help that's that's bypassing like the yeah. bypassing the actual process that needs to be seen in our sober state mm. mm -hmm. yeah that's the thing is it's more than just like the actual session of the chemical induction yeah. you should also prepare for it before yeah. and mm -hmm. also incorporate it after it's this whole experience that goes beyond the actual when you're high <laughs> right it's it's way more than that it's to be revered and respected i truly see these things as a sacrament and that only makes sense i think after you take the sacrament <laughs> right to anyone else they might just think you're getting high and trying to have a good time and just like any other drug but no these things are truly sacraments they have been to many other indigenous cultures of the past many ancient cultures use them as sacraments our culture and our egocentrism just likes to shoo them away but truly these things are magic i don't know how else to explain them maybe that's a crude term but i truly think they are magical me too but the way i see drugs is something that you take to escape pain Mm. Uh, to suppress pain yeah um whereas mushrooms ayahuasca san pedro uh peyote they can take you to immensely high states but they often and i would say in the majority of time take you into deep dark places where yeah. you've hidden suffering pain trauma mm. and that is not pleasant that's the opposite for me of drugs because yeah. it's like it's like no let's become conscious of this like yeah. let's bring it all up like you can't escape this there's no way you can run from this there's mm. nothing you can take to stop this process either once you're in it it's like it's here yep feel it look at it and yeah there's way to escape it so it takes it harder but what we need to do in this process is like sit with it mm-hmm let it move through. Allow that pain to move through. Allow it to be transcended. And that's the magic of it. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. so those that have listening to have done plant medicines, it's 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 not bypassing. It's not just for pleasure. After that purging, 
after that transcendence, there can be huge expansions and heart expansions, a lot of love and a lot of bliss and happy feelings. But it takes that purging. It takes yeah. that healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the opposite of escape. I don't know what the yeah. word would be, but it's embrace, maybe. It's the total opposite of what one may think of as a drug. It's um, making yeah. unconscious conscious. Yeah. Uh huh. Truly. In a very direct way. Yeah. Yep. Truly. And I also think, not suggesting anybody to to do these. I'm not saying you have to do them, but I I feel as though if one is really serious on the path, and you haven't experienced psychedelics yeah, potentially i'm not saying you are but potentially you're missing out <laughs> because they can truly help you they can truly help um many of us and it's hard to generalize and it's i know that's a very general statement i just made but i feel like a lot of people can be helped by these things that shoo them away because they are labeled a drug they are in the united states a schedule one two three whatever they're a felony so I think a lot of people discount them and even spiritual people, quote unquote, discount them for that reason. But I don't know. They can help a lot of people and not everybody. I know that, but they can help a lot of people. And it's unfortunate that we live in a time where they are very illegal. And maybe as time goes on, we will get to a point. And I, I think truly we are getting to a point where they are going to be more accepted actually legal and accessible for all of us to be able to truly heal and if we're talking about as we spoke about in the beginning an exponential accelerated healing process and awakening well i think psychedelics are going to be our sidekick <laughs> in that right in that and regard. i think that's happening mm -hmm. all over the world it's spreading like plant medicines and and um it's the same thing there. It, it didn't used to be much about that at all. And now it's like every other person is doing something. Mm. Um, and ayahuasca wasn't even known if, like 10 years ago. Yeah. There's just a few people. And now it's like a common name. My parents know what it is. Well, I mean, they know what it is because I've been taking it. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. It's almost a fad at this point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's a positive. It can be looked at as a negative because there is like a sort of psychedelic tourism that comes with that. There's a, you know, light and a darkness I, to all everything, right? I think it's a part of the plan. Yeah. The divine plan. Mm. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's like there can be no other way. No. Have you heard that the spiritual center moved from Tibet to Peru? What do you mean the spiritual center? What what center? So like the the kundalini energy of Oh, of the earth you're saying? Uh-huh. Oh. Used to be the center used to be in Tibet. Mm -hmm. And then during the 60s it started moving. Uh Drinvala Masisidek wrote a book about it. And so that it traveled down the west side of the U.S. and down Panama Canal and down South America and then settled in Lake Titicaca between Peru and Bolivia. Mm. And since and that happened in 2012, the energy settled in oh. Peru. Mm -hmm. And since then, plant medicines have pretty much exploded all over the world. Yeah. And people are coming in drones and to, to Peru and to Brazil and to Colombia and to Ecuador to take different. And, and shamans from the jungle are traveling to the States and to Europe to share medicines and knowledge. Mm. And I don't think that happened in the same scale as it's happening right now. And for me, that's the proof that like, Consciousness is shifting, yeah. but it's shifting. We have whole different tools than we used to have. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting you say plan. I do think there is a plan. There is something that is way greater than us going on. And you can either be a part of it or not. That's the thing. He who is not with me is against me. You're either going with it 
or you're not with it. Right? Well, we're a collective consciousness. So we're all with it. Is that what you're going to say? In one way or another? Kind of. Yeah, yeah. kind of. <laughs> I, I, it's like, you know, like imagine a pool of water. And every molecule within that pool is, is part, is a human, is yeah. a human consciousness. And so everything that happens in that pool, like every person that awakens sends these transmissions throughout the collective consciousness. Mm. And then the more people that awakens within this pool consciousness, the easier it gets because it raises the frequencies where the whole collective consciousness and it creates these, it's like a mycelium network, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It, yeah. it opens up to create these pathways for this higher consciousness to come through. And so the people that are resisting, they can resist as long as they want, but they're still a part of the collective consciousness. They're yeah. still part of the shared energy. And so as there's more love, it also brings up these really heavy energies, these really heavy emotions mm -hmm. to the surface. Like we see it in the world. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's more separation. Yet at the same time, there's more love. And yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Because the love is bringing up the separation that needs to be seen and healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel that. It's all part of the plan. <laughs> yeah. Everything is for you, right? We said that, but also everything is for all of us. It's all part of it. I know it may be tough to see, like, I don't know, bring up Gaza or uh, specific instances like that war in Ukraine or famine in Africa, right? How is that? for all of us. But if you look at it maybe in a larger time scale, this plan that is unfolding it makes a little more sense, you know? Like all of the darkness of the world is eventually going to bring all of us, not just specific people, but all of us to a greater enlightenment, right? To truly I think a inhabitable world for all of us, a world of peace. It may sound like some hippie talk, but yeah, I think the plan is ultimately bringing all of us there and it's a little rocky. It can seem a little rocky, but I think um, the darkness only yields to the light. And it seems very accelerated at this point, as we spoke about before, like the awakening, but also is the darkness is accelerating and they just feed, they feed off each other. Like you can't have one without the other, it's yin and yang, right? It's kind of like the resistance only brings harmony and the greater resistance that we see is only also going to bring greater harmony. So, yeah, that makes sense. I get it. We're all with it, but not all of us realize we're with it, right? <laughs> no. And there's still a lot of trauma that needs to be healed here. Yeah. There's a, a lot, lot of generational trauma. If you look at Gaza, like that whole that whole conflict, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, there's so much generational trauma. Mm. And on the surface, it might seem absolutely horrendous. And I guess I'm in the great faith that there's something, there's some healing that must occur, but I guess it can't be any other way. Yeah. So you look at it as healing, right? Look at it as great healing, generational healing. Yeah. Yeah, my son like bypassing um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't help in the best way that we can. But yeah. um, at the same time, you can't change someone else. Mm -hmm. You can't change someone else's path and you can't control someone else, even if they create great destruction. Mm. You can only lead by being your best self, which might sound like bypassing, but it's... Uh, it's all we can do. <laughs> it's all we can do. <laughs> Can't yeah. fight fire with fire. You have to fight it with uh, with water, with light, you know? You have to transmutate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And that's the big lesson, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. We save ourselves to save the world. Yeah, 
and to become the peace, mm -hmm. which can be hard even in, in our individual life at times, right? Like how can each individual person or me as a person become the peace and love that I want to see in the world? <laughs> hmm. In that way, it's also very simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy though, but it's no. simple that it's all about you. We spoke about this in the beginning. We can talk about all the worldly stuff, but there's nothing you can do about it at the end of the day other than no. heal yourself. You heal yourself, yeah. you heal everybody else. So, yeah, sometimes I wish I could save the world just like this. Ah, oh, world peace. <laughs> no. <Nope>. Right? <laughs> Not that easy. Yeah. How we do that is we go within and be still and know, truly. So it's like simple, but powerful. Subtle, yet powerful in that way. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to have to be savior of the world, actually. Right? I wouldn't want to have to be the messiah. But going back to it, in a certain way, we all are. We're our own Messiah. We're our own Savior. Yeah. But even look at Jesus. I mean, like, he did, I mean, he was a super powerful avatar of being human, though. Mm. And he just left a message of who he was. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that have reverberated in different forms throughout since he's passing. That's a good point. I feel as though once one reaches a certain embodiment of this wavelength we're talking about, of love, it transcends one's life. As in, it reverberates. This wavelength, this sense of servitude extends further than just the service that you have while you are alive. And you don't have to be as big as Jesus or any other prophet. Maybe it's just the people in your life, your family, right? Your neighborhood or something like that. There's a part of you that sort of stays here and is remembered here and thus lives through others, right? There's like this love is, it's like greater than your life here. And it's just natural. You don't do it for that reason because that's egotistical, right? You don't do it to become like that. I think it's just natural. I think the love that we embody here, and maybe I'm crazy. This is just me speaking. The love that you embody here ultimately extends further than just the goings on of your life. Somehow, some way, you are um, immortalized through the imprint of your servitude, right? And you don't have to even like write a book, right? You don't have to get crucified. You don't have to create anything necessarily. You can just be a genuinely good person where people tell stories about you. You're like, oh, that Gary guy, he was always, he was always very charming or whatever. You know, just like your, your essence lives on through others. And I think that's the wavelength that we're talking about here. It's like somehow, some way, love lives on and it lives on to hopefully serve others as time goes on. But you don't have to be like Jesus. You can, I think, learn from him in that he might be even the greatest example of that, of the logos. But you take that into your own life and just naturally happens, I feel. The love just lives on. I feel in other people. You know, I feel just like my dad, my mom. Like, they're going to live through me and just how good of people they are, right? They're just like... <laughs> You know what I mean? Just like you feel the love and it just lives through you. That's really what we are at a primordial essence. And that's why God is love. And that's why we're drawn to love. That's it. Yeah. That's it why it resonates so much because yeah. that's where we come from. Yeah, exactly. It transcends our bodily demise. It transcends all the suffering that we go here. And it's not bypassing, but there it's the truth. It's like, it's like, amidst the suffering you can see it in a different light if you know that love is the truth and it transcends all of the temporary bs of our life in a certain way you know? and it makes it all worth it exactly <laughs> <laughs> it makes it worth it right it makes because it worth it if you yeah. don't see it that way it's like what are we doing just suffering here is this us just um, is this are we all just like going against the grain like yeah that's so i don't know why I've never seen it that way. It makes life worth it. Love makes it worth it. And yeah, maybe that's you can corny. go through. No, <laughs> I mean, 
You know, when you go through like a really deep something, like it's really painful, whether it's in plant medicine ceremony or just in life, mm. and then on the other side of it, it's this, this expansion, <laughs> this love, uh. and you're like, ah, mm. now I understand. Yeah. And it's well, like it everything just clicks. Yeah. Wow. And you're kind of grateful that you had that because you can realize that love through that. Mm. Like in the moment of suffering on track contraction, it doesn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side of it, it's like, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's like immense gratitude because mm -hmm. you can experience that love again. Mm. Mm. Gratitude. Seriously. <laughs> immense. Immense. There's moments in my life where I'm just like, oh, thank you. I'm just thanking something, thanking God, thanking myself. <laughs> thanking nature i'm just like oh thank you thank you thank you it makes it worth it i'm gonna remember that one it makes it worth it <laughs> yeah wow that's one of the deepest prayers i have continuously is just help me open my heart help me receive more love mm. From God, from my guides, like from creation itself, just help me feel how loved I am. Like help me feel that love. Mm. Like clear everything that's blocking me from feeling it, from allowing it, from receiving it, from accepting it. Because that's the only thing that's blocking us from God mm -hmm. is stuff. <laughs> yeah it's the only thing that's real and it's we do it to ourselves we run away from mm -hmm. it ourselves it's sort yeah. of ironic yeah. we're almost we masochist. fear yeah. yeah well it's 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 this paradox we fear the separation from love and so we create blockages around our heart because the feeling of love can be so excruciating in like in the best ways mm. that we fear to lose it and so then uh, we block ourselves from it yeah it's like this twist mm. <sighs> this is pretty powerful yeah <laughs> oh man isn't that a miracle right when one is bestowed with that um revelation of love because as you said you grew up in an atheistic household, as did I. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything of this. I mean, I knew of love. We all know love. But when you realize, <laughs> when you realize, like, that's the truth, man, that's the truth. It's not just like love is equal to anything else. It's like, I mean, it's or love. related to a person. Yeah, or, exactly. Or conditional yeah. in that way. It's not in the way that we were told, right? That we believed it was. When you realize that this truly unconditional love, and maybe even love isn't the right word, there's other words for, for it like um, agape or prema and whatever word it is doesn't do it justice but we'll just say unconditional love that is actually the truth it's not fear it's not war hatred separation competition like we're led to believe like no love is actually the truth we're actually in a benevolent universe this experience is actually benevolent, right? If you yeah. just go on the basis and the foundation of love is the truth, that's like, hallelujah. That is truly yeah. a miracle when one um, has that dawn upon them. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's priceless. It truly is priceless. And uh, and we're so loved that we can allow it to separate ourselves from it. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. That's exactly, yeah. Like we... Um, the free will essentially like we had the free will to separate from that love and that's how loved we are is that we're not controlled is that kind of what you're getting at is that we did this yes we are part of god we're an expression of god mm -hmm. so we are creators whether we're conscious of it or not mm. and so we can create separation from that love mm. like the even the idea that we have to earn it or be good enough for it it's 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 false it's a, yep. it's a it's a false belief it's a it's a false idea yeah and that idea blocks us from receiving that love and that's why my prayer is please help me remember how loved i am because 
it, it's 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 also to be able to share more Amen. once i remember it it streams there's like how can i not love if i remember how loved i am exactly <laughs> which is unlimited which is infinite which, which you can't is even infinite put into words. no and it's not even an intellectual idea it's an experience of feeling that love i feel it i feel it right now ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i don't have anything else to say christina I, I feel that we could go on and on about how wondrous and truly majestical this love is um but this is why i do these things is to remember as you said you pray to remember i come on here and other realized beings help me remember and hopefully you and the listener are feeling the same way i just uh i feel it right now in this moment and it's true it's truer than true so yeah i think um we can probably start to wrap this thing up to be honest because <laughs> i might start crying <laughs> tears <laughs> might start shedding <laughs> but um thank you so much for having me of course do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap this up or just want to keep it at that no i think i think that's perfect yeah, I'd like to love, know about your awakening, but that's maybe not for this conversation. That's a long story. I mean, I don't even know where to get started. Yeah, there might be another conversation, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I actually literally don't know how to answer that question. A lot of people ask me, like, what's your journey? You know, I've been on other podcasts where people ask me that stuff, and that's the toughest one to ask. You know, it's a question of questions, really. Who am I? Where does this all come from? How did you get on this wavelength? I never know how to answer, man. I really never know how to answer. Um, so yeah, maybe another time. <laughs> I'm gonna meditate on that. But um, I don't know. Yeah, I feel bad. I want to answer your question, but I just like I don't know. I no, feel like it's I'm... for another time. Yeah, we're we're too uh, we're too far gone. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, I appreciate you coming on here. Really, I really do for sharing your time, effort, and wisdom and helping me remember you are um, truly a special being, very warm spirited. I feel it through time and space, right? Doing this on a video call is truly miraculous. Another miracle. Being able to do this and um, yeah, just feel this stuff. Sitting in front of a computer screen using a microphone and a camera leads me to believe that we are somehow some way connected in some realm that isn't physical, right? Like I feel like I tap in with people and we get very connected and you're halfway across the world and maybe people are doing that also in the future at this point right like they feel this wavelength that we're feeling um sometime in the future listening to this well time and space doesn't exist really exactly it's a, it's a social construct exactly so me doing this is just another reminder that truly time and space is an illusion <laughs> um yeah, that's it. I thank you for coming on here and reminding me of all of this stuff. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Peace and love to you and peace and love to anyone. Much, much love to you and everyone that listens to you. Yeah. Goodbye.